Thank you very much for uh, coming here. Uh, I want to thank Susan for arranging all of this. I've always wanted to come to New Zealand to give a talk, and this is the first time ever in my life that I've been invited. I don't know what that means, but you know, <laughs> uh, certainly means something to me. Okay. No, honestly, you know, I have. Uh, uh, it's a little bit far away from France, but it's wonderful to be here, and I hope that this is the beginning of a very productive relationship. Uh, uh, I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about uh, where our team is going in terms of thinking about you know, the connection between law institutions and firm productivity, which links back into the economy. That's what I want to talk a little bit about. And I think that there's no better place to talk about this than in a law school because, you know, in fact, it all is kind of like very much rooted. A, a big part of we have shown in the last 10 or 15 years that a big part of the differences that exist uh, in terms of success at the firm level, but also at the economy level, has to do a lot with legal institutions. Okay, but that's not it. That's not all of it. Okay, that's a big chunk. And uh, so the second part of what I will talk about is precisely about, you know, uh, human capital of managers and how, you know, actually that may explain a huge part of the unexplained productivity differences across firms once we control for all of these, you know, institutions that we've worked on. Okay. So that may link a little bit uh, into some, uh, some of the issues about how we move forward once we have gone through the first wave of, uh, of shocks to institutions. So I thought that I would talk a little bit about two parts, okay? I would first start talking about what I think we know, what I think we know. Of course, there's an intellectual debate about everything I would say, and I'm sure that some of you may be on that side or on this side, you know, whatever you want, there's an intellectual debate, and I think that's a very interesting way. Uh, to move forward, so but I think I'm going to talk uh, first. I'll give you a brief summary about the impact of institutions on uh, on firms, okay? Uh, and then I would say that you know beyond all of what I think we know, you know, there's this new wave of thinking that we're working on. What else is missing? Which has to do with CEO education. So I will go through a couple of papers that I have with my usual uh, co-authors, you know, Laporta, Schleifer, Vishni. Uh, uh, on these two topics, okay? And it all boils down to this idea that, you know, it seems like, you know, these large unexplained differences in productivity among firms within the same industry cannot really be rationalized from the differences in institutions, so we need something else, okay? And this something else is gonna be, you know, we might like it or not, okay? But it has to do a lot with the education of the CEO. And then I would try to tell you why this education of the CEO might actually be uh, a factor. So how it allows the firm to exploit its, its resources, okay? So that's what I will talk about, uh, if that's okay. If you, if you wanna ask me questions, you know, as we move along, or if you wanna just say, you know, anything that you think it's wrong from the very beginning, just please, you know, feel free to do that. Uh, as soon as you want, okay? Good. So I will give you a very brief view, if you will, about the impact of uh, institutions or firms, what I think we know, and then we'll move on to, to managerial education, okay? So there is this, in, in, in the last, you know, just, uh, yeah, this is just a brief introduction. So in the last, uh, in the last, you know, now, now it's, you know, 20 or 25 years, people have been thinking about since the fall of the wall, you know, with, uh, with the former communist countries and, you know, there are a lot of the liberalization of the economies, people are thinking about, you know, so what are good institutions, okay? So how, how can we have, how can we promote good institutions, good regulations, good laws across countries? It was fairly easy to have this discussion, you know, back in the 80s and the 70s and, you know, in the early 90s, because there was this capitalism versus communism thing, and then it was very clear that, you know, some people were on the good side, some people were on the bad side. Wherever you lived, you know, that depends on where you are, okay? okay. So, but then the, then the wall fell down, and then it's sort of like now everybody's kind of like capitalist, but in fact, there is a lot of different forms of capitalism, okay? And uh, so we saw that the institutions within capitalist countries actually vary quite widely, okay? So that was kind of the idea. And you might say that all of these institutions have the goal of, you know, either economic or political, have the goal of promoting 
you know, safer, uh, you know, you know, better property rights and investment and, and you know, uh, higher investment and development and so on, when some of them do and some of them don't, okay? So what I will review is I will review the evidence that suggests that, in fact, within capitalist economies, the, the institutions are very different. I will try to figure out where these differences come from, okay? I will tell you, you know, where we are, so it comes from legal systems, differences in legal systems, so it come back, it comes back to law, so we are at, you know, at the root of the problem in this school, okay? And then I will try to tell you, show you some very, you know, pictures that shows that it has actually matters quite a bit, okay? And then we'll move to what is missing, okay? Fine. Okay, so, you know, step back, you know, so we wrote, at, at some point we wrote a few papers about, uh, you know, where, you know, institutions come from, okay? And we say, well, you know, think about, you know, an economy, and as an economy is developing, you know, it starts to figure out how it should regulate itself, some form of another. And uh, as it's trying to regulate itself, you know, you may think that those that are in power are trying to set up the institutions that, uh, that, that, that make the rules for business to thrive, okay? Now, you would think that, you know, people would choose efficient institutions, right, based on what they are. But nobody, you know, but this, but there may be the case that the institutions that are chosen are not optimal or efficient from the beginning, okay? And these are two big channels, theoretically, two big channels that might explain why the institutions that we observe today across countries may not be efficient or the optimal ones for each country because sometimes politicians mess them up. Okay, and politicians, you know, choose or or manipulate institutions because they want to pursue other goals. Okay, you know, their own goals rather than the goals of society. Either they protect their friends or you know, or whatever you want. Okay, so thus, so this in involves some inefficiency away from efficient institutions, and actually leads towards some. Uh, in empirically, we're going to see some excessive regulation. Okay, the second channel, which is the one that I, me, uh, my co-authors and I have been exploring is this channel of colonial transplantation. That is, forget about politicians. You know, on top of politicians, not everybody gets to choose what are the institutions that they, that they have because at some point somebody got conquered, okay? And, you know, so this is, you know, it's good or bad, whatever you want. I'm not going to make any statements. This is not, we're not going to say that, you know, uh, colonial powers were terrible and we should repent, you know, for the rest of our lives. The fact is for, our, for ourselves is that through colonial transplantations, as the British, you know, you know, land with their ships, you know, they bring their common law. And as Napoleon moves around, you know, he brings his codes, okay? So a couple of hundred years later, it so happens that you really didn't choose the institutions that you had. It actually was the Brits that brought them to you, or Napoleon that brought them to you, or a couple of other guys floating around, okay, that didn't take them. So this is the big map that we economists, not very smart, we just discovered like 20 or 25 years ago, okay, which is, in fact, you lawyers must have known this for a long time. We just discovered it a few years ago. And we said, well, in fact, not everybody gets to choose the institutions. This is another inefficient source of, of, of laws, okay, not efficient laws, because whatever was optimal in Britain need not be optimal in New Zealand, okay? Whatever was optimal in France need not be optimal in Indonesia, right? Uh, just because Napoleon sort of like took over the Netherlands and the Netherlands happens to own Indonesia, then bang, 200 years later, Indonesia has French Napoleonic codes. It doesn't mean that Indonesia developed its best set of institutions, in particular, you know, what we're going to talk about, commercial institutions, okay? So this map gives you like the origins of the laws. So we see that a lot of countries in the world have either borrowed their laws from common law, or for French civil law, which is everything that is in orange. So you see that the biggest French export is not really wine, okay, <laughs> but French Napoleonic codes, okay? It's not L'Oreal, but French Napoleonic codes, okay? So what we have here is that those guys, you know, basically cover about 75% or 80% of the world. Then there is, you know, the Germans that never really liked the French, so the Bismarck then develops its codes, and then, uh, and then, you know, you know, by, you know, by the fact that the Japanese wanted to copy the last thing in life, okay, which was the German codes through the Meiji Restoration, then they bring the German codes, and then China, boom, has German Napoleonic codes by accident. 200 years later, okay, 
And that's, that's what explains you know, who gets the loss. Okay? So you see how China gets these very random institutions just because you know, a few things happened in the last 200 years. Okay? Then there's the weird guys in Scandinavia freezing themselves up, uh, Scandinavian coats, and then the three red weirdos that you know, are about to disappear. Okay? Uh, or blow up, God knows, okay? So, but mostly, uh, so, but mostly these are the places that, this is the origins of the laws, okay? And this happened to be a very powerful map that we economists did not have a clue about until, you know, uh, the late 1990s, okay? So with this map then we said, aha, this is very important because, you know, we, we can break the chicken and the egg problem, which in econometrics we will call endogeneity, that is, you know, is it the case that institutions develop to protect markets, okay? Or is it that markets were very big and therefore they developed law to protect the big money? Okay, after all, you, and you, you might as well know we're a law school. Law is a luxury good, okay? So you only have it when you can pay for it, okay? What is worthwhile having it, okay? So this chicken and egg problem gets broken up by the fact that you didn't decide you know, to develop your level of institutions is the Brits gave it to you. They landed in your shores and boom, this is what you have. Okay? So for us in economics this is very powerful because it's called an exogenous instrument. That is we break the chicken and the egg cycle and then before we can say now we know it goes from law to markets. Okay? So this was very powerful in that sense, and this is what will allow me to say that all of the graphs that I will show you next, which summarize like 10 or 12 years of evidence that we have, actually have some econometric validity, validity if you will. That is, we're not just talking about correlations, okay? This is linked to that, but I don't know what comes first. We're talking about causality in some sense, okay? So we have this thing, so this is, I think, the three things that we know, I think, that we know, okay? And as I said, there's obviously discussion about this, okay? Uh, but I think that even the most, you know, op uh, fiercest opponents of this view would actually have to agree with this slide, okay? So the slide first says, you know, it so happens that it all started in finance, by the way. So we started with law and finance, how law affects finance. And it basically says, you know, legal, legal rules, the first thing that we know is that legal rules of investor protection in this in financial markets can be measured. I know that you know in, in law school, you know, lawyers think that nothing can be measured. I understand that, okay? But you know, because everything depends on something and depends on something and depends on something. Fine. Maybe we didn't do the best measurement that we can, but you know, we have done several measurements and, and we all seem to be very close, okay? It seems that if you measure it, maybe not be perfect. A loss can be measured then and coded across countries, okay? And it showed that some countries have stronger protections to investors than others, okay? So some protect investors and some do not. That's a fact if you code them. And that these legal rules, you know, which show different levels of investor protection actually vary systematically among legal traditions. The slide that I showed you before where the French legal origin countries in particular are not very keen on protecting investors and the British uh, 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 common law countries seem to be the ones that protect investors the most. Okay? Moving beyond finance, okay, the next decade pretty much has shown that, you know, in fact, civil law and in particular French civil law, but you can generalize it to civil law in general, that is non-common law, not only shows heavy hand of, you know, if you will, government involvement in the control of capital markets, but also in other areas of the economy, okay? So we can see that civil law has, uh, shows, exhibits a much heavier hand of the government in all of the areas that basically regulate business, okay? The working of business, okay? So what I will try to show you is I said, imagine that you looked at the regulation of, uh, this is a good time for me to take this question, well, yes. Question. Yes. Okay, because uh, this is where it started. This is what we measured. But in fact, you know, contract law. So you know, when we talked about contract law, it was a little bit uh, later. Okay, that has to do mostly where we look when we uh, when we talked about contract law was mostly embedded into labor regulation. Okay, so the approach that people have about 
you know, how, how you how we have a labor relationship, okay? But if you looked at, you know, contract law in general, you would, you would observe those differences. But we started with, you know, it all, this is, I'm, I'm telling you what, sort of where we started. It all started with, uh, what shall I call it, with shareholder rights and creditor rights. That's how it all started. And then it moved into other areas of law which have to do with labor law, which have to do with, you know, Securities law, uh, securities, uh, security, uh, regulation of social security, which has to do the way you open up a business, which is, you know, it just has moved on into the way anything, a lot of the areas of business, okay? And embedded is contract law. So civil procedure, we also like that, okay? okay? Absolutely. But I'm just telling you what I think, you know, so how it started, okay? Absolutely. But if you looked at contract law, you would observe also very marked differences around that. Okay, good. Uh, so let me just try to show you a little bit of what, where, where we started and then we'll, we'll just jump to the missing part. So the, this is the positive part, okay? So you see that how, so this is more or less, your, so from the different legal origins, these are all of the, so I'm not gonna focus only on, on contract law, okay? So you see these are all of the areas of law that have been codified in some form or another, and you see that they map nicely into some specific market outcomes. Okay, that's what, you know, that summarizes all of the evidence, okay? If you put all of these, you organize them in these three buckets, okay? Let's say that you organize them in three buckets, that is financial regulation, uh, you know, courts and proceedings, and then other kinds of regulation, government involvement, you will observe the very, very big differences among uh, buckets, okay? So this will be, let's say that this is bucket number one. So this graph just tells you various air measurements, okay, what you have, in the, in the lower index is each of these m names is a different paper that measures different types of protections of investors. And you can see, you know, imagine that common law is zero. You can see this comes from regressions, okay, controlling for everything else. So you can see how all of the other civil law systems, which are the French, the German, and Scandinavia, tend to be lower in investor protection and much more in uh, involvement of government in banking. So there is more, protect, more, more government involvement in banking. So you can see that it seems that in terms of financial regulation, you know, uh, common law countries are less invasive. And it turns out that this actually impacts very heavily. This calls, comes from regressions controlling for everything else that you can think of, okay? It says that, for example, if you increase, you know, the protection of investors that call that anti self dealing then you have bigger stock markets. Okay, as a proportion of the economy, and lower, you know, what people call uh, control premiums, that is the value of controlling uh, a firm, okay, because you can extract less, okay? So it also shows you, for example, that if you protect your creditors further, you have bigger credit markets, okay, or bigger financial institutions, yeah. Just on the previous slide, New Zealand was an outlier. What, what do you think New Zealand is always an outlier, you know, geographically and, you know, in many other ways. I mean, it's not really an outlier. You, you, you're complaining about that stuff. I mean, it does. I mean, look at Hong Kong. It looks much worse than Switzerland, okay? Uh, no, this is, you know, given, you know, but this goes back to the conversation that, that I just had with, uh, uh, precisely with Susan, okay? So Susan was telling me that, you know, it's like, you know, here we are sitting in New Zealand and we've done a lot of the stuff, right? So we have a lot of these rights, okay? And we're not up there, we're down there, so what else is going on, okay? So you'll see that New Zealand is not down there all the time, but this is a very big question and I would love, I would love to work on that. This is why I was telling Susan, maybe we should start thinking about trying to figure out how these outliers may come to the line. Absolutely, okay? Now, not everybody needs to fit the line, so there's, there's differences, so this is exactly how can we make New Zealand move up there, down there. It doesn't look as bad in that other one, okay? So, so the, which is about the control premium, so they were very close to the line, okay? So yes, there is some idea, value to the idea that New Zealand is an outlier, not just geographically, but you know, it, we, have to, we have to think about that, okay? Just on that point, that what the economy is not represented in our stock market. I'm sorry? Most agricultural economies? Uh, in New Zealand. Most oh, no, but this is, you know, but this is, you know, but this is, what this is precisely saying, you know, there's more agricultural countries. Uh, we don't need to explain every point, okay? But the point of what he's saying is, like, if you protect investors more, can you raise capital, okay? Can you access capital markets uh, more, 
Okay, this is what this is saying. Okay, and I don't see why any reason why you know agricultural firms may also list in stock markets. Okay, you know I understand that farms pop and farms don't. Okay, but they may you know there's very very big agricultural firms that list too. Okay, just like small mom and pop shops don't list. Okay, uh, so what firms in agriculture might do, uh, you know. Uh, no, you, you think about it, you know, think about this one uh, in terms of creditors. You know, New Zealand protects creditors quite a bit, so it uses credit rights. And in fact, if you look at the credit market, so a lot of, the, uh, you know, part of it is like a lot of the capital that is coming to New Zealand firms that would seem to be right on the credit market. It doesn't seem to be right on the stock market, but it seems to be kind of like right where we would predict in the credit market, okay? But it also, you know, in terms of government ownership of banks, you see that, you know, it also shows that, you know, the more government ownership of banks you have, the least inefficient banking systems that you have. Okay, but interest rate spreads are bigger. Okay. Can I ask what period this data is taken from? So this is, you know, with, we have several periods. The last one, the, the ones that I'm showing you in these graphs, yes. is from 2005 yep. to 2013 or 14. I cannot remember. Okay, so it's a decade. Because this is the revision that we did for the paper that we did, the chapter that we have in this handbook of uh, 2000, came out 2016. So probably we stopped in 2014. Okay? Yes. But if you did this graph from 19, you know, from, t you know, from 1995 to 2005, you will find more or less the same. This is not, I mean, this is not, uh, this is not really, uh, that the period doesn't seem to be, it's long lasting institutions, okay? Now, so that was bucket number one, okay? Now, given the time that I have, I'm gonna talk very briefly about bucket number two and bucket number three, otherwise I'm never gonna get to Nigeria. So that was the idea that, you know, uh, uh, institutions of financial markets matter for the development of financial markets, okay? Second bucket of regulation, okay, let me skip that. Regulators are thieves, so that doesn't explain much, okay? So here's the second one, which is uh, government regulation in other areas of the economy. So regulation of how you open up a business, regulation of entry, that's regulation of labor, how invasive, you know, how difficult it is to fire and hire people. Okay, the involvement of government in the press and, you know, even the involvement of government in, you know, in the army. You see how the French or the civil law is much more invasive than common law across. And that has impacts also in the labor market, okay? When I show, uh, so this shows you that if you make it very hard for firms to open up, Okay, you, what you have is a lot more corruption, in fact. Okay, and then you'd have in a much bigger, you know, unofficial economy. So this suggests that you know what you're not buying. You know, all of this protection you, uh, you know doesn't buy you much. If you regulate labor's a lot more uh, labor markets, if you regulate the more you make it stiffer. Okay, sort of like you see that how you know so uh, labor force participation goes down and unemployment rates go up. You know, particularly unemployment of the poor. Okay, of, of the poor, of the young, okay? Which then become poor, okay? Uh, this is the last area, which is judicial institutions. You know, there's, you know, this is another, you know, sort of like courts, and this is various measures that we have about courts. You know, you see that, you know, formalism in court. So this, uh, so this is like civil procedure, measuring civil procedure and how you go about collecting a check or evicting a tenant. This is some stuff that we did in the past or how free are the judges from the Supreme Court from government influence, let's say. So you can see that common law seems to be less formalistic and gives more freedom to courts, okay? And you see how that actually fits into, you know, less uh, formalism, uh, uh, le more formalism, sorry, fits into longer times in court, and in the end it buys you nothing in terms of, you know, what people think about, you know, contract enforcement, okay? Yes. Oh, no. Thank you for telling me. No, I don't exclude them. I'm measuring everybody else against the British, against the common law origin, okay? So common law would be here. I know he doesn't like me to do that because I'm in this guy. So common law would be here, okay? So that I'm trying to show that, you know, there's differences versus common law. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say, okay? Absolutely, we do not want to exclude the common law. This is, you know, <laughs> absolutely not. You know, the French would like us to exclude common law, but we're not going to do that, okay? Good. Uh, so this basically says there's three buckets map into something real, okay? And uh, 
So if we were to summarize this, this you know, it says that, you know, maybe as we think about it, there seems to be a lot, you know, these institutions are not, you know, very effective. Okay, we saw that the, the inefficiencies come from politics and from colonial transplantation. So we may be moving into inefficiently high levels of regulation. And we also see that, you know, a lot of it, even more higher of inefficient regulation would be probably in French uh, or in civil law countries than in common law countries, which, you know, uh, which started with less invasive regulation. Okay, fine. Okay, no, we're going this way, fine. So that's the part that I think we know, okay? So we think that there is this very large component of the efficiency of firms and the productivity of firms in, uh, that comes out of the impact of institutions, okay? And the way we measure that was by comparing across countries the differences in legal institutions. Other people have started to go in differences, legal institutions within countries, okay? So measuring differences within countries about different institutions, okay? So some countries, for perhaps some provinces have different institutions than others, okay? So some, you know, so there's a very large literature on that. And so we're gonna get all of those numbers when we move into the next phase, which is moving into firms and regions, okay? So the first part of the talk was to try, try to say, you know, listen, I think we know what explains some differences in, this two, uh, in productivity, but there's still, you know, the big puzzle that we observe there is that there's still very big differences in productivity among firms within very narrow industries, okay? <laughs> within the same country, okay, which has the same institutions, okay? So um, this is not data from me, okay? So this is data from the kings of the guys of measuring, you know, total factor productivity, okay? So this is a summary of, uh, this is a summary of what people have found out, okay? If you look at, for example, this is the US, you look at the graph below, this is, you know, total factor productivity, T TFPQ, okay? Uh, and you can see that, let's say that, you know, one is sort of, sort of like what we have uh, that at the center, okay? You can see that it can go all the way up to four or five, okay, versus one, you produce one versus four. Most productive firms produce four or five. The least productive firms, you know, produce one sixty-fourth uh, 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 of, you know, apples, okay? So you can see that there is humongous productivity differences within even within economies that are supposedly have very large access to capital markets, like the US, think about the US, very large access to capital market, hopefully very good institutions, blah, blah, blah. There's still very large productivity differences. If you move to developing countries, you know, so there's something like China or India, you can see that these productivity differences may be even wider, okay? So therefore the talk of today, so it's like what is it that may explain this other part? I mean, I, what I have just talked to you about is I said, you know, we can explain a lot of the stuff that we have in the world from here, this difference between this and this three, this three, it's all of what I said, okay? Now I'm interested in explaining here or here, okay? So we, we figured that out a little bit, okay? But we have not figured this out completely, okay? So that's what I wanna talk about, okay? Any other questions? No? Okay, good. Okay, so what explains these productivity differences, okay? So we economists, as usual, it takes us forever to do anything, like you lawyers, if you work with things quickly, just write them down. We sort of like, you know, <laughs> we have not figured out much of the stuff and we definitely don't like to write things down, okay? So, you know, we have long speculated about these productivity differences that we've studied as well. Sounds so obvious, it has to do with inputs. Right, so of course if you have more inputs or better quality of inputs, then you can explain higher productivity, okay? So, you know, so we, the traditional approach uses like raw materials, capital, labor, technology, blah, 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 blah. And when you put all of that in, there's still humongous differences in productivity that we cannot explain, okay? And therefore we said, well, this is not gonna get us very far, so we now need to move to the next thing. So what about human, like, human capital? human capital of managers, okay? There's been some work about human capital of labor, and that has actually shown that it explained a little bit, but not a lot, okay? So workers' human capital, the education of human workers, didn't seem to be like a humongous 
you know, a factor in explaining the productivity differences, okay? So what we have is, we, we, so what we did is we said, why don't we try to go and get new data, okay, across countries, across regions, across firms in the world, in different regions, in different countries, and we try to see if the human capital explains a lot. Okay, so that's what we did, okay? So we try to analyze directly and compare, you know, the, uh, the impact of human capital of managers but also we're gonna have workers, so, so we have some measure, into the firm productivity differences. Okay? Good. Okay, so fine. Uh, so let me skip all of these guys that say that there's, just to say that there's many factors that I may explain productivity differences. And I better start by saying, how do we start? So we start by actually uh, looking at, I'm oh sorry, we start by looking at differences in productivity within countries, that is within regions, and then we look at differences in productivity of firms within each region, okay? Because if there are differences in productivities within countries that come from differences in regions, then we're gonna be attaching too much to the differences of just by firms. In fact, there may be regional factors within the country that explain part of the difference, and then there will be firm level factors. So we have country level factors, which is what I talked about. So we throw that into that side. Now we're gonna work within countries among different regions. And first I will show you that there are very large differences, you know, in human capital across regions and that they have an impact in productivity within the region. And then we're gonna see at the third level within those regions differences in productivity in firms, and then we see that is the human capital of the entrepreneur that explains a bunch. Okay, is that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. So, but first I need to get with from step one to step two, which is I'm gonna work with regions now. Okay, so in order to do that, you know, we worked like crazy for five years, okay, and we got this data, okay? So we said we're gonna shut the world in 2005, okay? And we're gonna see, now we have a 2010, okay? Uh, so we're gonna see all a ton of data, and we'll show you what kind of data, for all of these regions in blue. So we, not have, we don't have country data, we have regional level data, okay? So we have a few regions missing in Africa because they don't collect the statistics at all and we couldn't force all of them to collect them, okay? But we forced a few, okay? Uh, and then so we can see that we have all of the differences in regions. So within the US, we're gonna be talking about data at the state level, okay? So within Australia, we're gonna be talking about data about those guys, and you know, within New Zealand, we're gonna be talking about data about, you know, within those, you know, within the different regions, okay? Is that clear? So it's like a ton of data. So we have, you know, about 1,569 regions in 110 countries, okay? That's more or less what we have. And uh, so we're collecting data of all of that stuff, oh, sorry. We're collecting data on geography, that is endowment. So we have, now there's all of this, you know, tech stuff like maps and so on, all that stuff, you know, uh, are collected from satellites and so on. So we have temperatures, distance from the capital of the region to the coast, resources like oil, blah, 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 blah. Then we have institutions, so as we said, institutions are gonna marry and there's differences in institutions within regions uh, of the same country. So we have all of those, like corruption and you know, a, you know, access to finance, blah, blah, blah. Then we have infrastructure, so we know about you know, electricity density, we know about a ton of other stuff, okay? And then we have other values, like th there may be differences, there's like cultural differences, so we have culture, trust, blah, blah, blah. Ethno-linguistic fractionalization, and you know religions and so on of that stuff. Fractionalization and all of that stuff. So that's a humongous amount of data, with, you know, which people hopefully can use and are using. And then we also have obviously population differences and so on. Okay. So we collect all of that data. Okay. And this is what comes out of that uh, as the beginning. So I'm just going to summarize. Imagine that you took countries. Now we were, uh, what I'm going to try to show you is. What explains differences of you know, income per capita, which we, regional, which could be called productivity of the region, okay? So the productivity across regions within countries, okay? So look at, you know, look at Russia, okay? 
So Russia, these are all of the different, you know, oblasts or regions, if you will. And controlling for other factors, okay, controlling like for institutions, blah, 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 okay. You know, if you look at productivity differences among regions, you can see that the average level of the school, uh, this is it's, it's education of the average person in the region explains quite a bit, okay, of the differences in productivity that does not have to do with endowments, that does not have to do with institutions, that does not have to do with temperature, that does not have to do with all of those theories or fractionalization or culture, or ethnic fractionalization or culture, it's education that seems to be driving the day. If you actually, I just show you four countries, for example, but if you pull the 110 countries together, okay, this is the net effect. So you have, you know, you put all of the countries and then together and you put the variation that you have from each of these countries within. And then you see, you know, each of these dots, you know, for example, each of these dots is, this, this is a different province in this country. So you can see different provinces, okay, within countries. That's where we have multiple of the same. Okay, so you can see that the net effect controlling for temperature, you know, to, which you can call geography, temperature, distance to cost, you know, resources, which you know we they call oil, population, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and even country domains, a lot of it has to do with education. In fact, when you look at uh, look at you know, just stream and compare it with institutions, okay, if you look at the years of education. For a, you know, we have it for 104 countries homogenized, okay? You can see that it explains, first of all, between countries, okay, education explains about 58% of, you know, uh, of the R square, okay? So the R square, if you just put education in a very simple one, like univariate fixed segregations, education explains 58%. And you know, informal payments would be an institution corruption, let's say, 21%, and trust would be about 80%. So you would say, you know, they're all kind of like there. Education is very big, three times as big, but you know, they're there. But once you move within countries, it sounds like all of those institutions, like like corruption and so on and so forth, and trust, just collapse in terms of the power to explain, and it's education that seems to be the driver of the differences within. Yes. Okay, so you take the average level of education of the population within the region. The whole population. The whole population. Why is years of some of the conservation is years of education negative? Oh, but okay, so fine. It's a very good question. This is what is called the partial scatter plot. <laughs> so um, it's, not, uh, it's not the actual number. This is, imagine you run a regression that says, you know, here you have on this, on this, uh, uh, so like uh, the variable that I'm trying to explain is income per capita, okay, log of income per capita, and that's gonna depend on temperature, oil resources, blah, 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 and the log of years of education, okay? Now, what I'm showing you there is the coefficient on this and the variation around that coefficient controlling for everything else, okay? So the coefficient of that regression Okay, is 0.27, so that's controlling for everything else, and that's the variation around it, that's the statistic of that coefficient. So it's not the actual number of years, but so it's kind of like, you know, it's been processed through this machine, so it gives you the variation, normalizes somewhere around two or something, okay? So it's not the actual number of years. This is what, you know, Larry Summers called partial scatter plots, okay? Which is the net effect, that's why I call it the net effect, okay? So you can't really read the number, as a number, it's you have to just read the, the slope. Okay, yes. So were there any account taken of differences in quality of education? Okay, so we cannot, I mean, this is very big. Yeah. We could not do that. Okay. Absolutely. A lot, a lot is explainable just by virtue of the number of years. Yes, yes. I mean, I understand that, you know, one year, you know, in, in Switzerland may be better than one year in let me not say another no country, okay, but you know, <laughs> uh, in another country, okay, I, I, I do, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, we can't really do that. I will show you when we move to firms, okay, if when we move to uh, government, okay, I will show you that actually may matter, you know, the quality of education may matter when we talk to about CEOs, okay? But you know, ideally we could do this, but 
The idea that we're going to have data for 110 countries with the quality of education with the same granularity, it's very tough. We have some measures, okay? So I will show you some, you know, about absenteeism, like, like what is this uh, uh, abs uh, data, okay? So, so and it does have an impact, okay? I wish I had that, but, you know, this already was a very big uh, <laughs> effort. But the point very well taken, okay? Good. So that's at the regional level, so that, so then we said, oh my God, education explains a lot. So what about at the firm level, okay? So now we get to the CEOs, okay? Uh, okay, let me skip that. This just tells you that when you put in, you know, education, this works a lot. So now we look at the firm level statistics, okay? Let me skip that. We're gonna look at the firm level. And what we're affirming firm level, now imagine that you have firms, okay? So once we clean the sample, you know, we have this is like, you know, we have about 13 or, you know, 20,000, depending on the data that you have. We're trying to fir explain firm level productivity, that is sales per employee, clear productivity, controlling for a lot of stuff, okay? Uh, you know, country fixed effects, industry fixed effects, all of that stuff. And then we have resources, we have about, you know, uh, this would be resources like energy resources or property plant and equipment and so on and so forth. And what we observe is that controlling for all of that and controlling for the regional education, okay, education of the region, which is the effect that I showed you before, which is significant. The one that comes out, you know, worker education is important, you know, it's statistically significant. But once you normalize and you actually do the calibration, is managerial education seems to be the one that wins the day, okay? It explains about four to five times has the impact that worker education has. So we're not saying that, isn't that the educated workers do not help for the productivity. We're saying that CE educated CEOs have a humongous impact in the productivity of the firm. Okay? Why is the number of countries so low? I think we okay, so this is we're like summarizing into sort of like, so now we have only like 30 countries where we have all of this incredible data about expenditures or energy and expenditures. As I move some of these things, remove some of these things, then I get into much, much more countries, right? So this is, I'm giving you the toughest thing. When you remove that, it's even better. So this will be like the toughest regression, okay? And actually, you know, the, the toughest, toughest one, you know, so the last one would be this, this one where we have. If you really want to be very, very, you know, very, very, very concise and want to just go to the toughest sample where you have all of the data, you move it all the way up to here and still, and it's, it's very, very big, okay? Okay, so what does this mean, okay? So the evidence suggests that, you know, the, uh, we have been misestimated the returns to education to managers, okay? Because we haven't really been measuring them and putting them in the equation for productivity. We just haven't. We focus on the education of workers and we have forgotten about the education of managers, okay? And they seem to be the education of the CEO. May I, by, by the way, the measure that we have is the education of the CEO. I, we don't have measures of the education of second level manager at this level. So I have the years of the education of the CEO across firms, okay? And that's all firms or just particular kinds of All firms. Okay. And then we're gonna control for industry and whatever you want, so you can do industry work. So it's for all kinds, it's all in manufacturing. All manufacturing. All manufacturing. So we're gonna throw out financials and agriculture. This is all manufacturing, <coughs> okay? But it's many different, you know, industry codes in manufacturing. But it's in man that's a very good question. Manufacturing firms, yeah. Just so apart from education, did you also have the number of years of experience of the CEOs? I don't have that. So it may very well be that a very highly educated person uh, would be very help productivity, uh, but it's because that person had 20 years of uh, experience. Yeah. In the yes, sure. Th it could be, I mean, it could be, okay. Uh, so what we do know, and I think, you know, we don't show it here, what we do have is how many years the guy has been in the firm. Okay, I don't think we have it in these regressions, okay? Uh, because it didn't turn out, once you control for that, uh, it didn't turn out to be that important. What we have, if you had been working in multiple establishments, we have the age of the firm, which turned out to be more so older. Firms tend to be a little bit more productive, and that seems to be very correlated. That's what we threw it out in the end. 
because that seems to be very correlated with the years of experience of the CEO. And this one actually turns to be better than the other one, okay? So we have that for this very small sample. We don't have that for this very, very large, you know, 40,000 sample, okay? So when we get into this, you know, really trying to get all of the stories apart, okay, we still get that it's actually the years of education on top of, on top of that. So it's, it's, I mean, it's not that his experience doesn't matter, but it's sort of like, it kind of like gets, gets uh, subsumed, okay? Now, the age of the firm, which is very correlated to the, you know, to the experience of the CEO, it's important. We, we know that all the firms, you know, learn more and so on and so forth, okay? So, th so that's part of it, but that's a very good, that's a very good point. Now, why do we think that people actually have, uh, why do we think that these CEOs may be very good for the firms? And this is just a speculative. This is somewhere where we need actually need to go, okay? So it could be that firms, you know, uh, that educated CEOs may be better at organizing production, managing firms, or adopting or developing new technologies, okay? That could very well be the case. Or it could be that, you know, these differences in the Nigeria edu education explain why not all firms are able to take on opportunities, okay? So good firm policies may not be successfully adopted by all firms because these firms do not or cannot afford high human capital of CEOs or highly educated managers may be able to adopt much faster something new that comes out. Okay, so they may be faster at uh, getting, uh, getting at it. We do not have any clue about that yet. Okay, we don't, you know, maybe some people do, but you know, we, we don't, okay? And not, not at this level. So, but it sounds to, it's, it's correlated to the, uh, a little bit to the CEO, okay? Uh, do I have time to do the next one? Are you serious? Okay, so let me take five minutes, okay? Okay, just five minutes, okay? So then, so then we said, okay, how can we go a little bit deeper in trying to figure out what makes the difference, okay? And then we said, well, there's this other big puzzle about, uh, there's this other big puzzle about, you know, why are governments, different governments, so uh, why are governments, uh, some governments efficient and some governments are very inefficient, okay? So that's a very big question. So the one of the reasons is, well, there's political economy reasons. You know, there's some guys that are very corrupt. There is some, you know, all of that stuff, that the, the typical stories, okay? And then we said, well, another reason is maybe, okay, is, you know, some governments have bad managers, okay? And these bad managers are just bad managers, and they just cannot organize production just like a firm, okay? So this is when we decide, so this is the idea that low productivity of government servers may be similar to the low productivity in the private sector, okay? So there is inferior inputs, human and physical capital and technology, and there may be poor management that comes out of it, okay? But now we need to design an experiment that allows us to you know, remove all of these stories from the equation, so take them out of the room, that says these stories cannot explain these productivity differences, okay? It can only be about human capital and initial resources, okay? So that's when we designed this, uh, uh, this paper uh, uh, that's called Letters. So, okay, so the paper is called Letters, okay? So what we said is like, obviously measuring government efficiency is too big, okay? <laughs> so we're gonna focus on one single service, which is very simple, which is mail. Every country has mail, okay, post office, okay? And we're gonna focus on mailing a simple letter, okay? Like a very simple letter, okay? So what we did is, you know, we sat, you know, and then we mailed letters to 159 countries. We mailed 10 letters, okay? Two to each of the five largest cities in each country. And the letter basically had a piece of paper that said, hi, I'm, you know, Rafael Laporta, you know, I wanted, you know, to get in touch with you to carry out our you know, research project, okay? That's all that the letter says, more or less. Do I have the letter here? No, I have the envelopes, okay? Uh, so, but, but you know, we kind of like tricked the post office because we put the address we included had an ex the right city and the zip code, but there was the wrong street and business name, okay? Uh, so, so this is then we send them, uh, you know, we send them into waves because then you can instrument the second wave with the first wave, all of that stuff that econometricians like to do, okay? So the letter was one page business letter in English requesting a response from the recipient, okay? 
Uh, and then we waited for, you know, I don't know, un ungodly amount of months, like 40 <laughs> months or something, you know, for 420, ye 420 days. So Lapo, you know, Laporta would go every day to his mail, uh, you know, in, at Harvard, and then he would pick up his mail, and then he would mark down, okay? I got the letter on, you know, the 3rd of January of 2012, okay? So we knew when we posted the letter, and we knew when Lapo got it, okay? And, uh, and this is the kind of envelopes that we had. So we waited for 420 days, okay? Notice that the beauty of the experiment is that this is a letter, okay? So it's like, you know, this, it's not like you want to steal the letter, okay? So it's not corruption, okay? So the efficiency is not the cor someone wants to steal if it was not a $20 bill, okay? <laughs> it doesn't take really a genius to sort of like figure out that the letter doesn't go to the right address. You just put it on the different, you know, beam, okay? So it takes away a lot of the political economy story. So we're just focusing on resources, okay? So that allows us to build a production function that says, well, the productivity, this is the productivity, is how many letters returned back to us at Harvard within the period. There is a convention, we didn't know about this, but you, you learn so much about stuff that you really don't care. So there is this convention, okay, of the postal offices around the world dating back from 1969 that basically says that 159 countries, which is the ones that we send the letters to, signed this convention that says that when the letter is wrongly addressed, the country needs to resend it back within three months. And the country, it's not like the country that received the letter has to pay for it, it's the sending country that pays for it. So if anything, you would like the gringos to pay <laughs> for their mistake, right? So, so the Americans have to pay back for the mailing, okay? So it's not like you don't want to send because you're, you're, you have, don't have resources, okay? So you can see this is the kind of letters that we got, for example, this was, uh, this was you know, we picked also names of economists, okay, from the country, okay? And then we have a firm that doesn't exist, and you can see that this is the address, and then, you know, this is what we get, okay? Fine. So how did that come out? Okay, so we're gonna get into the quality of education here also too. So this is what, this is two countries for example, and I will promise I'll finish in five minutes, okay? Uh, so this is two countries. We sent 10 letters to the Czech Republic, which seems to be a fantastic country. So you have here, we sent the 10 letters. This is the name of the guys, the address, the postcode and the city. When we sent the letter, okay? And when the letter came back, and this is the date of the limit when we stopped, you know, when, when Lapo said, okay, enough, I cannot go to the post uh, uh, anymore. So you see that the Czech Republic sent all of the letters back completely and all of the letters within three months, all of the letters within three months, which is what everybody agreed on. So they get, so this is the number of days in the last column. So within 52 days on average, they had sent all the letters back. Russia, okay. So this is the letters in Russia, we got no letter back <laughs> in 420, 18 days, 20 days, okay? We got no letter back and then, it was very funny because I think a TV station got a hold of this thing and then they ran a TV show, you know, which had, you know, grandmas, babushkas crying that they never got the mail, cats roaming, this is from their show in the TV, you know, TV chain number one, okay, cats roaming through the mail, eating the letters, and so on and so forth. So it was quite a show, okay? So if you put all of the countries together, you know, this is what you get. You get that on average, okay, if we had, we got about 59% of the letters back, okay? Uh, about 35% of them came within three months, and the average time that it took to get the letter back was 228 days. Okay, now you can see that high income countries did a lot better because they had 84% of the letters bad, 60% within three months, and only took them 125 days. And after that, it just falls down. For low income countries, okay, you only got a third of the letters back, less than 10% of the letters within three months, and it took them 336 days. So there's an income component, and there is an educational component. You can see that countries with low education also got you know, only 46% of the letters back you know, in 281 days, okay? Now, with all of this fantastic data or whatever, you maybe you think crappy data or interesting data, whatever, what explains, you know, if we got the letters back? So we created these variables, which is productivity, okay, which is there. And we also have like incredible data that you would never think you would have. 
like because this these guys in the post you know this is co postal code convention they've been collecting data of postal offices since the 1970s i mean it's like an insane amount of data like we know the number of letter boxes that exist the number of staff the technology of the sorting machine of the letter that reads the letter and so on and so on. I mean, it's insane the amount of data that you can get out of these guys. So we have all of those variables, that, which are you know, inputs for production. And then we put all of these measures which have to do with education or quality of education. Okay? And you can see that controlling for everything else, okay, measures that people associate with you know, some systems which have you know, higher managerial education, if you will. For example, here's quality of management schools. We should have one that says quality of law schools, but it doesn't get collected that much, okay? And anything that has to do with management practices, which is, you know, better monitoring practices, you know, managers that set targets to their employees, managers that set incentives and so on and, for, and so forth, although they have only been collected for about 20 countries, okay? Uh, these ones are more for wider countries, but they're very correlated. You can see that management quality kind of like explains a lot of the differences in productivity, okay? So when you put that in regressions, okay, you can see that controlling for everything else, you can see that, you know, the proportion of letters that we got back is much, much higher if, you know, there's higher, you know, management education as we can measure it for this, uh, for this kind of like cross-country data, okay? So, I mean, so there says that the quality may also come in, okay? Now, I wish we had better measures of, the, of that stuff. Okay, so uh, let me finish with this. So taken at face value, okay, you know, so I think that what we've said is institutions such as law matter, but they're not all. I think education matters quite a bit, okay? And it actually explains a lot of the differences. So if you wanna understand the differences in variation of income across regions, you kind of need to get to human capital. And if you wanna understand the differences in uh, productivity across firms, you have to get to managerial education. And even for the differences in productivity in governments, okay, there is this, you know, manager, managerial component, a managerial education component that turn, turns out to be uh, pretty good. So maybe some answer for New Zealand. Some countries have very similar institutions that they inherited through legal transplantation. Some of them are possibly not the best, or some of them are, you think they are the best. But maybe, okay, there's something about human capital that may explain something. Now, the puzzle of New Zealand may be bigger because human capital is not so low, okay? But I don't know about, you know, human capital of managers, okay? So maybe, I don't know, we should ask that to the law school, or to the, to the, to the, to the business school, okay? Okay, but it sounds that, you know, uh, people with right human capital, okay, may be detonators uh, of productivity, okay? But I, so I think this is where we're kind of, we are kind of going, this may not be very interesting, but I think this is where sort of where we are. Okay, good. Thank you very much.